So today we've got Colin going over chapter 21 iterations, right? So I am super excited about this chapter because when I was going through it myself, trying to learn, it I gave up. I said, this is too this is too hard. I just need someone to sit me down and explain this to me in words. I'm not going to figure this out by reading a chapter. And so here we are. We're finally here to talk about iteration and per and Colin, the expert, is gonna is gonna handle it. So I guess I'll just hand it over to you then, Colin. Sweet. Take it away. I would I would hardly call myself an expert. I can I, I know how it practically works. Um I will also admit that when I was first going over some of like the, the for loop and the while loops, I haven't used them in a long time. So it took me a little while to uh, remind myself of how they worked. But um, yeah, so what we'll do is let me share my screen with you so we can. And I also pass along some mm -hmm. examples for you because I think we're kind of at the situation. We're kind of in chapters that are hard to kind of explain with the slide deck. So I pass along a notebook in the thread that has some examples that we're going to go over tonight. Um, to be honest, I don't think we'll get over. Well, I don't think we'll get through all of it, which is fine. I think we have schedule for next week. So we'll just see how far we get tonight. Um, everybody can see my screen, correct? You can see my five minute icebreaker. So uh, the question for tonight is, I don't know if we've asked this question, but if we did, that's all right. Maybe you change your mind on it. So we'll hear you. You'll see if anybody changes it. So what's the most useful item you have purchased this year? That is a good question. I've been stuck inside for most of the year, so. Um. Sandra's got it. What do you got, Sandra? Yes, I, yes, I cannot win. I was against video game, but I gave up and I bought um, a Nintendo uh, Switch. And actually, I am so I play more than the kid. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Because I play the, I play the game Overcook. And I was completely addicted and my husband is upset because I spend my time to cook for my online customer and I don't cook anymore. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got to have some entertainment. So, you know, video games it is. Who else? Who else had something interesting that they bought this year or useful that they bought this year? Or, I guess a good purchase. I uh, I have I have one. So, um <laughs> I, I don't, this is going to, I guess this is going to end up on YouTube. So the world's going to know more than they should about me. But um, so I, I've had, I've had the same cover um, bed covers for a long time and they started to get kind of ratty, but they were so comfortable, you know, and you kind of wear them out over time. And so I was on the one hand, I was like, you have to have just the right one. You're not too hot and not too cold. And um, and so I, I resisted buying a new one, but uh, finally got a new one this year. And it turns out I got lucky. So I got just the right one and it's brand new and it works and, it, and, and it's perfect. So that's probably the most useful item I've purchased this year. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Excellent. Uh, Monsa, what about you? So someone gave me their old ukulele and before that I'd never played any string instrument. And then that broke, so I bought a new one, and that has been the best purchase. <laughs> you'll have to, you'll have to come by. You'll have to come and play sometime. Sure. Maybe we'll do. Maybe we'll do a five-minute icebreaker for you to <laughs> play your instrument for us. Sure. Monta, the icebreaker is Monta plays a ukulele for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I would go for that. <laughs> a nice little interlude before we start. That'd be great. I'd like that. <laughs> Great. Um, cool. Uh, I guess mine, uh, I, I mean, I, I used to have this old MacBook computer that I had for like 11 years and this thing was like a brick, but it would like, it just was a tank and it wouldn't give up. And then I finally broke down and bought a new one and, and I just over the moon, you know, I, I just so glad that I made that purchase. I know it was a lot of money, but it was well worth the money, but I still have this just big brick of a MacBook that's I still use it because it's just it's just awesome but it was probably the best decision I've ever made especially working from home too so excellent so um so let's kind of do some quick housekeeping reminders I'm not going to spend too much time going over these because we know these we're in week 21 by now week 23 so if you don't know these by now um, but I do want to highlight this important one uh, again if we need to slow down and discuss 
just let me know. Uh, I think we've been pretty good as a group to have a good discussion here. So don't be afraid to stop me if I miss something or if I say something wrong, um, or if we need to go into more depth with something, I'm more than happy to, to stop again. Remember, most likely if you have a question, someone else might have that same question. So um, just let me know. The rest of these, we, we pretty much know, but I just want to highlight that one because iteration can get a little complex and abstract at times. So, so tonight's discussion, uh, what we'll talk about is iteration. We'll kind of go over for loops. We'll talk about what they are, uh, how do we use them. We'll talk about the difference between for loops and functionals. Then we'll move on to talking about map functions within per. And then we'll talk about dealing with failure and I think that's all we're going to get to tonight because I have a few examples that I want to get through. Um, so next week, whatever's left over, I think looking at like multiple arguments and then I think there's another section we'll go over into next week. So um, we'll see how far we get tonight, but this is what I had planned to go over. So the first thing we have to kind of go back to because we've had this chapter of vectors, uh, we had functions and then vectors and then iteration. So it's a good idea just to kind of remind ourselves, well, what's the over, overall goal of using functions and iteration? And why should we learn how to use these tools? Well, really it comes down to that our main goal is to try and reduce duplication in our code. And we're trying to reduce duplication in our code for several reasons. You know, one being that we want to avoid copy and pasting. And so we go back to that DRY principle or the dry principle. Does anybody want to remind me, or is this a quick review? What does the dry principle mean? Don't repeat yourself. Don't repeat yourself. And what's the rule? When, how many times do you repeat yourself before you decide to either apply a function, iteration, or apply both? Twice. Yep. If you copy more than twice, it's always a good idea to sit there and say, okay, maybe we need to create a function or maybe we need to apply iteration or we need to apply both. So one re one, two ways to reduce duplication is one, functions, which we talked about a few weeks ago, and then what we're gonna talk about tonight with iteration. So why should we really care about, why should we learn how to use iteration? Well, it's easier to see the intent of our code when we um, use iteration. It's also easier for us to respond to changes in requirements and it's easier to de debug because we introduce less bugs into our code. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to take like a step-by-step -step approach that we want. So say we have a function and we want to apply that function again and again and again to different data sets or different objects. We can do that using iteration and doing that is going to be going to one, generalize it more so that we can see our intent a little bit more clear. And then we can also, if somebody has changes that we need to make, we only need to change it one time rather than several times throughout our code. Because if we're doing the same thing over and over and over again, we might as well at or generalize it some more so that we can just have the computer do it the same time over and over again. So that if we need to make changes, we just make one change rather than doing it several times throughout our code. And then also by making our code more generalized, it helps us, it draws our eyes to areas that we know that are issues. And so we go back to that example in functions where it was like this big brick of code and um, the authors had like one little thing that was wrong, like a, a letter A versus a letter B. Our eyes aren't drawn to the difference, it's drawn to the repetition within it. And so because our eyes are drawn to the repetition, it's harder to see those little minor issues that are within our code. So we introduce more bugs. So let's define iteration and talk about when do we use it. And it's really, it's really kind of simple. What is iteration? It's used in cases where we need to do the same thing to multiple inputs. And so you have multiple data sets. You want to do the same thing. So say you have the empty cars data set, which we'll talk about here in a second. Say we want to calculate the mean for every single column. Well, what we can do is we're just applying the same function. The function being mean and how we apply that function is, is that we use iteration. We say, hey, apply the mean function to every single column within the data set. And I'm, we'll talk about that here in a second. And then when do we use an iteration? When we're repeating the same operation on different columns or different data sets or different list items. 
So I'm going to bring in my first example for tonight. I was talking about empty cars here and I, and I forgot that I spelled iteration wrong here. So there's a typo in our notes. Saw that. Um, so the first thing that we're going to look at is we're just going to look at empty cars here. And when you look at empty cars, we have all of these columns to which we could calculate a mean. Okay. Well, it's the same function just being applied to the, to each column. And so what you could do, and this is one approach that you could do, is you could write this out. Mean, empty cars, M MPG, cylinder, displacement, so on and so forth. Well, this is a lot of duplication. And we can condense this down even more. I mean, it works. It gives you what you want. But at the end of the day, there's two issues with this. One, it's just a bunch of repetition, the same thing over and over again. And two, the output might not necessarily be something that you want to use. Like you really can't use this for anything other than this is just one single vector or one single object that gets outputted. What if we wanted this to be in a data frame? What if we wanted it to be in its own separate vector? So doing something like this will give us the answer, but it doesn't really give us an output that we really could use. Okay, so there's a better way. And the book talks about for loops first, and then it talks about functional programming second. And so we'll talk a little bit about for loops first, but um, let's kind of jump over here and we'll talk about that here in a second. But, um, oh, well, let's talk about the difference between imperative versus functional programming. So the book talks about imperative programming versus functional programming. Now, the way I kind of understood this is it's different sets of tools that you can use to apply iteration. So when it was imperative programming, you have different tools. You have for loops and you have while loops. And there might be other forms of imperative types of programming when we're trying to apply iteration, but these are the two that are talked about in the books. Now, it talks about the benefits of doing imperative programming using for loops and while loops. It's very explicit. You have to kind of list out all the different steps that you want. Well, first you have to set up your output then you have to set up how you're gonna iterate and then you're gonna uh, kind of write out the function that you're gonna to use to write it out. Now, the book talks about some downsides to this. It's very verbose and it also requires you as the person writing that for loop to do a little bit of bookkeeping to make sure you have everything in kind of the right places. Now, the other side of it was functional programming, which we'll get into a little bit later tonight. But the tools of function, functional programming are functions to perform common iteration tasks, okay? So uh, the book talks about the map functions in the package per, which we'll get to a little bit later tonight. But I really wanted to kind of highlight this first to say that anytime that we talk about functional programming tools, these are functions that perform common iteration tasks. So these functional programming tools may not be able to solve all of your iteration problems. They only solve the most common problems. So it's also good to kind of know for loops and while loops because you may have to use them in certain situations that functional programming tool sets don't really let you use. Some of the benefits for applying functional programming is it's less code, it's easier to set up, which re results in fewer errors. And we'll show, I'll show you a little difference between the two in a second. Some of the downsides that this comes across is it may not solve all of those problems. And then the other thing is you, you need to know what the functions do and how they work. So if you don't know what map underscore DBL does, you might have to do some digging in to understand how that function actually works, what's the output of that function. And so you kind of have to know a little bit more of how that function is applied. <laughs> okay, so here's the anatomy of a basic for loop. Uh, there's three basic uh, pieces to this. The first one is your output. So anytime that you, anytime that you do kind of a basic for loop, you need to set up your output. What's the container to which your output is going to be put from your for loop? And in this case right here, all we're doing is we're trying to create a vector of uh, doubles that is the same length as our MT cars data set in regards to the number of columns. Now, once we set up the output, we can set up the structure for our for loop. 
where we tell um, R, what do we want to iterate over? How do we want to iterate over it? And we use the body to define what do we actually want to do to it. And in this case, what we're doing is we're using, um, we're using this function seek along, which basically is, is using an index or a number index to say, okay, first element, second element, third element, fourth element, do this to it. So I'm going to bring back the example here because I think this is going to clarify this a little bit more. But when we look at MT cars, you can think of these as MPG being the first element, cylinder being the second element, displace, displacement being the third element, so on and so forth. So when we're doing in when we're using the index, all it's doing is it's going one, two, three, four, five, and applying it throughout the whole thing. So what I'm basically doing here is I'm setting up the output, which is a vector of doubles. I'm saying, okay, for the I element, seek along MT cars and then apply this function, which is mean. And all I is, it's just a placeholder for the index. So anytime we say I, it's going to go one, which is MPG, calculate the mean, put it back into the first element of output. Okay. Then it's going to do it again. It's going to say, okay, well, I have a second element, which is cylinder, calculate a mean, put it into the second element of output. And that's all that's basically doing. And so if I run this, what I'm going to get, well, before I run this, given my explanation, what do you expect is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen from this? <coughs> so if I ran this code, uh, go ahead. Yeah, we'll end up with, with the vector output, and it's going to have however many, 12 or 13, whatever number of elements in it. Each one would be the mean of a corresponding column. Yep. So let's just try it and take a look. And that's basically what happens is we get a vector of doubles that are representations of all the means uh, for each column within MT cars. Okay. So does anybody have any questions about the basic for loop by using like indexing to like iterate through uh, an object? Yeah, um, you may get to this later. And if so, we can just talk about it later. But um, it's the idea of, of moving along a different thing. So it's like if you have I in sequence along and then it's a vector, how does it work? And if it's a list, how does it work? And if it's, um, you know, if it's different things, how does it, how, how do you know what it's actually iterating over? Yeah, that's a good question. Or if you wanted to do like rows or something like that, so. Well, that's a good question. Um, well, I guess it would depend on what you pass into seek along. I mean, what type of object? In our case, it's a tibble. But yeah. if we think about the basic definition of a tibble, all a tibble is, it's just a list of vectors, right? Using different metadata to have make it print pretty and <clears throat> to associate data with it. Yeah. So all this is, it's just a list of vectors. And so basically mm -hmm. all we're passing through is a list. Yeah, go ahead, Sandra. And if, for example, if you have a list of files, you could use a list, you could iterate around a list of files, you know, when you want to open and save a lot, a bunch of files. It's an example also, I don't know if it's in this book or another book, but it's a classical example of how to loop uh, on file. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I was thinking too, while Sandra was talking there too, is I wonder if we did like just a vector of one through five, if it would do, well, wait, uh, oh, it might. Well, let's just try it. I don't know. Well, it iterated over, but I don't know why it gave us a bunch of zeros, but it gave us the uh, first yeah, five. It gave you a bunch of zero because your output is defined with n call empty car. So you have set up the, the dimension. Oh, that's right. Because in our output, I set it up. I said, hey, our container is the size of, N N of MT cars. So if I change this through one through five, it would do the same thing. Uh, um, uh, maybe five. Oh, maybe five, yeah. N column five, not one through five. No. no that's Invalid even. length. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Because N call is a function to count five. the columns. Okay. So five. <clears throat> Now it should work. Now it just passed only five. 
And again, seek along is just taking in what we want. So seek along is taking in that vector of one through five, and then we're just applying this function to all of the of the one through five, basically. Did that answer your question, Ryan? I know that was kind of a long way around to it, but I yeah. was oh sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was trying to solve the iris example, I think calculating the number of unique values or something. And I was thinking how, how we could, in vector, how we could define only certain number of columns. So instead of, like, if we don't want to do it over all the columns, we just want to do from three to six or something. For a mm. subset of that, then I was thinking what would be the best way. And I, then I didn't think much about it, but do you have any idea? Mm. So Iris is a data set. So say, what is it? A, a, it's a, we have five columns here. So say you only wanted to do columns two and three, calculate the mean for like two and three. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, maybe, I mean, you could do it this way, right? I, I'm guessing, I'm totally guessing here. Uh, let's do Iris instead. And I mean, there's other ways that we can reference this that the book talks about. Like we can also do naming too. Like we can also use naming or uh, iterate over names of objects, but I'm just gonna see if this works. That might work two through three, but there's also another way to talk about it when we use like we can reference names in this kind of what we wanna loop over. So did that answer your question, Mansa? Yeah. That's one way. So Ryan, I think you had another question. No, uh, not really. I, I think it's just going to be kind of familiarizing myself with uh, with the different <clears throat> different uh, object types that you can pass in, um, and then also the different ways to sequence along. So uh, I know besides sequence along, you can do you can do other things too. Mm -hmm. uh, so I. I I can't, I can't remember what they all are, but I know that there's other ways to like, to iterate, so. And I think also too, it partly comes down to, um, you know, there's multiple ways to get these answers too. You know, there's probably a, a different way to apply functional programming through the use of map to do the same thing. So yeah. it, it's probably one of those questions of like, which way is the best way to do it? And there's multiple ways to get to that. And so like, you may not know all of them. Like I found just for myself, get the answer, right? Like just get, get it to work. And if it works, it's great. You know, I probably should ask more questions on if it's like the most efficient way to do it or the best way to do it. Yeah. But some ways I've just been like, okay, I know this works. I'm just going to get it to work. So, but cause I had a little bit of trouble going through these two and being like, I have, I haven't used a for loop in a long time, but I know they're available. So Okay if, uh, okay, if I may, some, sometimes you see applied to do this kind of stuff. You know, it's in air base, nobody will use this way to just to do something like that, it's just you apply. And if you want to review the loop, you just have to use Scratch with your kids. Uh, it's um, MIT, it's a, it's a block. So if you teach your kid how to code, you have to review everything. <laughs> it's my suggestion for you, it's just to, to to play with your kid in some coding uh, coding game like Scratch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Scratch. Um, yeah, there's like those those ga those games that teach kids how to do for loops and stuff. And I think that's interesting. Um, I, and I know I think you said something about L apply. I, I'll be honest. The base are verbs of L apply, S apply, and I think B apply. And I know this is recorded, and I'm going to say it. I have no idea how to use them because I've no, just, just done everything. Because it's, it's exactly to do the same. You know, it's, you apply across, you could do operation across row or across colon. We just apply. Uh, so nobody will do that just to compute a mean. You are not, you are supposed to, there is one line of code. So it's, yeah, but it was just because I know air base. So there is stuff I will never do this way. Well, maybe I can convert you into using per because per is the same way. You can kind of do the same thing with like one line of code. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go on record and say, I really don't know how to use all apply, S apply or V apply. So um, maybe someday I'll learn how, but everything that I've ever needed to do, I've had used per for. So, but we can talk about that some more. Um, 
So we were already kind of talking about this too. There's different ways to kind of go to iterate. Like we were talking about using the index. Well, we can also loop over elements. And the book kind of talks about that looping over elements is good for capturing side effects. So such things like printing plots or saving files. So here's an example of just going over the different elements. And what I'm basically doing here is I'm using the for loop. Um, and actually I didn't have any output for this, but I set an output, but basically all this for loop does is it goes over the elements of empty cars, which is the columns. And it just explicitly prints out the ggplot items to my viewer. So if I wanted to, and I'm gonna go over to my code over here and run it so you can see it. All this does is it's just gonna output it to my viewer. So if I run this, do, 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 it just made a bunch of plots so I could look through them really quickly. So I thought this was kind of neat because like if you needed to make just some quick exploratory plots, something that you're not going to publish or send to your manager or boss, this is just a quick way to go like say, all right, I have a bunch of doubles in my data set. I want to see, you know, I just want to see how they, you know, what's the scatter plot for like an outcome variable, like miles per gallon. Here we go. Quick way to do it. Um, so that's looping over elements. Oh, you can also save files this way too. Um, I would rather do this in a map function, but you can also do this to like, uh, you can also loop over elements to save data files because when you write files, you just want the side effect. You don't really want the output. You just want the side effect of these functions. And so what I'm doing here is I'm using this, I'm taking empty cars and then I'm splitting it by the column, which is cylinder. And there's only three columns in cylinder. And so basically what I'm getting is I'm getting a list, a list with three objects in it. So like, I think it's like three cylinders, four cylinders, six cylinders. And what I'm doing is, is I'm using a for loop and looping over the elements to save my files. So basically what you're going to see here is if I run this by looping over the elements, because I just want to capture the side effect, which the side effect would be the actual writing of the file on, in, onto my system. So if I run this, basically what it's going to do is it's going to save a file in an iteration folder with the creation date. And it's going to take a second. So if I go over to my files into iteration, you can say, you can see it saved three files because it split it into three different items. So I feel like I, feel like I wasn't too clear on this. So does anybody have any questions about, on how to loop over different elements and to use that to capture side effects? Yeah, so, so you know, starting from back at the beginning of a split, does it, um, does it create data frames or does it create lists? It creates a list of data frames. So we can look at it. So if we look at empty cars, we know empty cars. Right. If I run this and then I look at just empty car split, uh -huh. you now have a list item because now you have three data frames. Okay. And with this syntax, basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, look at this cylinder column and then just make a data frame for each individual item yep. in cylinder. That's cool. I've never seen that before. Yeah, this is actually, I've done this quite a bit. Uh, I do this actually quite a bit with split. Um, like if somebody wants like data split in a certain way, like demographics, that's that's a slam dunk. Like say somebody wants like different metrics for, you know, different income groups, split it into separate sheets, send it out. Um, uh, go ahead. Can you can you open your empty car split to know if it's a name list or no? Uh, Can you check it out in uh, just to click on the empty car split at uh, in the environment? Just uh, in the okay. Just if you click on Air Studio um, empty car split in environment, yeah. My environment. If you click here. Mm -hmm. okay, oh yeah. So it's name. So it's name for okay. Yeah. So split will set the names for you. So split okay. will set the names for you. I mean, I think another way to see this. Because you can go like struct, you can go structure and do empty cars split, empty cars split, 
and look at it and it will give you the structure here. And then another way that I like to look at it too is to do like a, like if you want to see a, a list, go view MT cars split and then it will pop up another, just like we saw before in the environment pane as well. Right. So this is a very simple list. Like if you had a, like a big, I'm going to call it a mega list. This is like, these are great tools to kind of use just to kind of look at it. But again, it goes back to, you know, with looping over elements, what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture the side effect or we're not really trying to capture the side effect. We only care about the side effect. And in this case, our side effect is actually writing that data to disk, writing our data to our hard drive. So, so then, so we've created a, a list. We went from a data frame to a list of empty car split. And then when you have 4x in empty car split, it's now iterating over each data frame. Is that right? Yeah, because we're passing in, we're passing in a, a list item here, right? We're yeah. saying over each element do this. Yeah. I guess, I guess that's the, the way I would put it. Yeah. So, so just thinking about, it's like if you pass a data frame into a for loop, then it's going to iterate over each column. If you pass a list into each data frame, then it's going to iterate over each list element. And so there's got to be some trick if you wanted to iterate over each column of each data frame in a list. And you know, I don't I don't know what it is, and we don't need to look at it, but but I, I think there's some complexity around like pinpointing exactly what what it is, what you what data object you have, and getting to the data object that you want to iterate over. Seems like it'd be take some practice. Well, and I, and I think the book talks about that, right? Like the different variations. And I think that's a good transition to where we're going right now. Uh, well, wait, where's my four? These four variations, right? So are you modifying an existing object? Are you transforming it and putting it into a new object? Or, only, or do you only care about the side effects? Mm -hmm. Like you said, you know, you, you got to know it's. I guess you can think of for loops and, and this might be wrong. I'm just thinking out loud. You can think of for loops like a function, right? What's your input? What's your output? And depending on what your input is, is going to depend on how you iterate over it and how you iterate over. It's going to affect the bot, like what you're actually doing to it. And that's going to affect the output. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and that's, I mean, that's a pretty big question, you know, but I guess it comes down to like, what objects are you using? And in the case of the tidyverse, we're only using tidy. We're using tidy data, right? And tidy data is just a a list of vectors with metadata attached to it. So, I guess I don't know if that's a good answer, bad answer, or that's my answer. <laughs> I, I see what you're saying. It is tricky. It's just tricky, kind of knowing what's your input, how is that going to affect the body or the function of it, and then what's going to be the output. And so, yeah, yeah. that is tricky. Um, okay, so we talked about the different variations. We talked about looping over elements. Oh, we have looping over names, which I think was kind of getting at where Monsa's question. But I mean, what we can do is we can loop over the names. And this goes back into our subsetting stuff that we talked about within vectors, right? All we're basically doing is we're just passing the name of the element for each element into our subsetting brackets. Excuse me. So when we have names, empty cars, basically it's saying MPG, cylinder, displacement, HP. And we're just using our subset, bra our subset brackets here to pass it into our new vector, vector, which is empty cars vector. So just another variation for you to play around with. I, I've never used this one, but it's available to you if you want to use it. So actually, Monsa, what you might do is, well, maybe that won't work. Never mind. I take I take that back. But it's something that you can use. It's available to you. Okay. So those are for loops. Those looping over patterns, looping over that. So now we're going to get to the to um, switching over, looking at the difference between for loops versus functional. So this kind of goes back to the one the one we first started talking about. R R is a functional programming language. So for loops aren't necessarily as important. Because what we can do is we can create a function to which we supply it as, or we as users supply inputs into it and just wrap our function around those for loops for us. 
So we don't necessarily need to always write out explicit for loops to do iteration. We can set up our own functions to actually do that iteration. And then we can call that function to loop over or to use our, to use our for loop. So this gets into the per package. And before I do that, I wanted to talk about one of the exercises. I don't know, maybe I just wanna show this cause this was a point of pride for me. But there was a there was an exercise that was looking at like doing different like lyrics, like where you defined your own function, and oh shoot I didn't go over those ones either. Uh, I I forgot to cover these ones too, but we can talk about them here in a second. But um, the book also talks about like looking at your different outputs as well. So like if you there are certain situations where you have iteration and you don't know what the output is going to be. Now the book talks about like random number sampling. I created another one that just did random states. And so basically I'm just gonna go over this quickly, but what I did here is I wrote a for loop to um, create just random state sampling is basically what I did. And so what this does is it's just gonna iterate over one through 10 and it's gonna take, um, it's just going to give me 10 different states to sample 10 different states out of our state names vector that's available to us. But the book talks about in cases where you don't necessarily know what the length of your output is, the best thing to do is to create a more complex output and then bind them all together at the end. And so in my case, if I wanted to create a list of random states, what the best thing is to do is to create that list and then bind them all together at the end. And that's what this function or this for loop does right here is I'm just creating a list of 10 different random selections. I'm iterating over it. And then once I have this big list of all my random states that I wanted, so here's just a, a list object with all the different state selections that I have. If I wanna create this into one big vector it's better to do it at the end rather than doing it in the for loop. It's the book talks about it as being more efficient. Um, a good example of this is, is if you're trying to like loop over like a bunch of data sets over and over again, and you want to stack them, it's best to put it into a list first. And then at the end, use like a row underscore bind to combine them all together. It's, it's more efficient. Um, so that's basically what I'm doing here is just random states flatten. And so now what I did is I just flattened my sections into one big vector. The other thing was it talked about um, unknown sequencing lengths. So there might be situations where you don't know what your seek along might be. It's not a predefined defined vector or predefined list or predefined data object. And I thought the best example in the book or the book provided the best example would be in situations where you're trying to simulate an event. So like flipping a coin. So maybe what you're trying to figure out is um, in situations where you wanna find times where you have a run of 10 heads in a row. So you're flipping a coin, flipping a coin. You're interested in figuring out how many times does it take to get 10 in a row? And so the book talks about using a while loop to figure this. And what a while loop does is you obviously have to set up your output. You have to start with zero flips. You have to start with zero end heads. But a while loop takes a condition. And basically what we're saying is, and this condition is, while our number of heads are less than 10, keep iterating, keep iterating, keep iterating, keep iterating. And so that's all this does. And if I run this, the computer took about 1,441 times before I got a run of 10 in a row. And so if I keep doing this, it should be random, you know, 1294 to 2301. But this only works because of our while loop takes that condition to keep checking the number of heads and it, will, it won't stop until it gets to 10. Now, uh, while loops, the book, the book mentions that um, you don't really use it very often, but I don't necessarily think that's the case. Um, I don't know. Does anybody here use, uh, does anybody access data through like APIs or application programming interfaces? <clears throat> well, one, one thing that I use while loops a lot for 
is when I have to access data through an API or an application programming interface. And basically what happens is, is like all an API is, is like I send a request to a server to return data to me. And sometimes it pages that data. And so I have to use a while loop to like check my conditional, like, is there any more data left? Oh, there's extra data. Okay. Send another request. Uh, is there more data? Yes. Send another request. So I think there's a use for while loops and especially when you use APIs, you know, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that's where I've applied while loops quite a bit. Now I know I walked through those things quite very quickly, but does anybody have any questions about um, like iterating when we don't know our output length or iterating in situations where we don't are like conditionals or where we don't know um, the sequence length. <clears throat> they might be very like very situation specific. You know, you may like find yourself saying, I've never used a while loop until you run across the situation where you need it, then you need to go look up how to do a while loop. Uh, I would say for the white loop, uh, don't forget to iterate plus one or plus something because if you do that, then after <laughs> It's loop, it's the infinite loop. So yes, so yes, so that you could say, don't forget the plus one. Yeah, so that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, and, and so the one thing, uh, you know, Sandra's talking about is your computer will keep running until that conditional is met. And if that conditional can never be met, your computer will run infinitely uh, as, as long as it has the resources to do so. Um, like a good example of this would be, uh, a good example of this would be like with APIs, right? Like I could be keep sending requests to a server to send me back data and it will never stop until the, until the API tells me to stop. And so I could keep hitting a server over and over and over again. Um, and I could get blocked with certain services if I keep making requests. So uh, know that your conditionals will be met. So good point, Sandra. <clears throat> So I don't know if this was, I don't know if I need to share this example, but there was a, there was an exercise with like the bottles of beer and I was like, I'm going to take this on. Uh, so you can look at this on your own, but I just wanted to share this as a point of pride. Um, basically I used a function to get my computer to do the bottles of beer song. And so for those that aren't familiar with bottles of beer, it's just a accounting song where it's like a hundred to 99 to 98. So basically, uh, I wrote this using a for loop to seek a lot. I used a function and a for loop to actually do that. And so, um, I don't know, I'm just going to share it with you as a point of pride, but basically when I run this, my computer will basically sing to me bottles of beer and it will keep going through. And there's like a little surprise in here when it gets to like, uh, when the <clears throat> number is at a multiple of five, it will do a hiccup. So I had to share it. I don't know. I don't know if this is the best use of my time, but I got it to work with a for loop. And so you can too. Um, so then it will do a hiccup here after 95. I don't know, hiccup, and then it will keep going on. So now you can have your computer sing to you uh, 100 bottles of beer on the wall. Uh, you could just take, you could take my word for it that my computer will go all the way down to zero, but I'm going to stop it there. Very cool. Yeah, and and you can and you can achieve the same level of awesomeness by using a for loop in R if you wanted to. Okay, um, that's enough fun for that. Let's talk about per. Um, so we're moving from imperative functional programming into, or we're moving from imperative programming into functional programming, and so this is where the per package comes into play. And I honestly, I just, I'm just amazed at per and how it works. It is hands down, other than Lubridate, I think per is like an, a really cool package. So if you ever get a chance, um, you should like navigate over to the per tidyverse um, kind of explainer, like the, the, uh, the package website, because it does have some really good information on how you can actually apply per. Um, what's also nice about it too, is it has the cheat sheet embedded into it. Now, this might be a little abstract at first, but once you kind of look at this and learn how to apply these functions, it kind of makes a lot of sense. Basically, all you're doing is you're just using these functions to iterate over some object. 
but I do highly suggest that you look at this because it, it does kind of walk through um, some really good examples of how to actually use the per package. Um, so basically what the per package allows us to do is it allows us to break down complex tasks by using the pipe. And so what you might be, what you can do with map functions is you can iterate over an object, pipe it, and then do another map function and then pipe it and do another map function. So if you have uh, an input where you transform it in one map function, that new object that you are, that comes out of that function, you can pipe into another map to do another thing to it. Now that's a little bit more complex that we'll talk about tonight, but just know, I guess the saying that I'll say is, is know that you can, you can pipe or you can chain together map functions to do complex iteration is basically what, what you need to know from that. Uh, it provides functions to solve the following tasks, loop over a vector, do something to each element, save the results. That's what map functions really do is they loop over a vector, they do something to each element, they def you tell it what to do, and then it saves the results. Now I've also linked this kind of really good blog series from Colin Fay. He did about six different um, six, six different kind of uh, things looking at per, like applying it practically. And so I linked this in here and I think they're really, really good kind of um, examples of how to apply per in kind of a practical sense. He does it for like web mining, text wrangling. Um, he talks about mappers, which we won't talk about here but doing statistics and stuff like that. But these are some really good kind of like step-by-step -step of how you can actually use PER to do like more complex things. So if you kind of learn the basics of PER and you want to know like what are some like more advanced things you can do with it, this is a great blog series that can kind of go over it. So I highly suggest looking over those once you kind of get the foundation of PER and how it works. Okay. So with PER, because it's, it's their, their tools that we can use to iterate over things. It's going to give us several different functions that we can use. The base one and the foundational one is map. Um, but what's nice about this is, is that per gives us different, um, different, uh, what are they called? I can't remember the word, what they're called. Go ahead. Don't they say Mm, I don't like know if that... the, it's like the outputs, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's the outputs, but they they name these a certain. I'm just going to call them variations, but there's a different name for them. That like it's the 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 words that are kind of eluding me right now. But basically, like Ryan said, it's just the outputs. So if we're going to iterate over something, underscore LGL would be output a logical vector, output an int vector, output a double. The one that I use a lot is map underscore DF, output a data frame. And I'll show you an example here in a second. Well, let's just show it to you right now. So let's go back to our first example that we started off with tonight. We want to calculate all the means for every single column in empty cars. Well, what we could do is we could write out mean and we get this output that's not very useful. Well, we could apply our for loop like we talked about earlier. Okay, that helps. It gives us a vector of all the means, but it's not very, it's, it's kind of verbose and it takes a lot of bookkeeping. With map functions, what we can do is we have our one line where we're taking our object and we're applying some function to it. And in our case, we're applying the mean function here. So in one line of code, I basically get um, all the means for every single column with empty cars. Now, does anybody want to tell me why do I get a list object here? <coughs> map always outputs a list. Yep, map all, always outputs a list. Well, what if I want this into a data frame? What if I want it into a tibble? Well, what I can do, and now I remember what the function's called, it's called the predicate function. So what we can do is we can use map underscore df same thing, we're taking empty cars, passing it into mean, and we're just calculating it, and the output's just different. We're outputting it into a data frame. So that's how you use a predicate function. Um, 
I haven't used any, I really haven't used the other predicate functions, but just know that it just changes the output, but it does the same thing. You, you give it an object and you're specifying the function that you want to apply to it. How you apply the function is you use that tilde, what your function is, and then you use the dot X as kind of like the, it's placeholder. So with empty cars, dot X would be MPG, then it would be cylinder, then it'd be displacement, so on and so forth, okay? So what questions does anybody have about the basic usage of a map function? So the dot X represents the item that's, the, uh, the, that's being iterated over. <clears throat> so map MT cars and MT cars is a data frame. <clears throat> and so then the dot X represents each column of the data frame. That's correct, yep. And so if MT, cars, okay. if, if MT cars had been a list, then dot X would mean each element, each list element. Yep. And, and you have to include dot X. Uh, you don't have to include dot X, but I just think, I don't think you have to include dot X. So I could just pass me, nope, you do have to, because it's what it is, is it's this, it's saying the, the function for mean. So yeah, dot X works there. Um, the basic way I think about it is it's, it's like the placeholder for each object. So again, empty cars because a tibble, again, is just a, a list of vectors that have metadata to make it look pretty. Again, I say that like I'm confident in it, but um, it's just iterating over each column essentially is what it's doing. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, but I mean, like this could be this could be a vector. It doesn't have to be a tibble. It doesn't have to be a data frame. It could be a list. It could be any object to it. Again, it's just going to influence what's going to happen here. Now, the function mean it may not take it, it won't take a character vector, right? So if we pass a character vector into it, we have to remember that it won't. It will it will give us an error because we're giving in our iteration we're giving that mean function, a vector of characters. And mean doesn't take an input of character vectors. So it's gonna throw an error and it's gonna stop. So if I tried to throw a list of like A, B, C, D, E, and F, it won't work. Or if I tried to go states dot names, name, it's gonna error it out. Yep, so st oh, states names. I think you get the point. Yeah, so object state abs not found. But anyways, I think you get the point of that. Any other questions about that? Okay. So we talked about this. Again, they're closely related to L apply, S apply, V apply. Um, and then we talked about the different examples in the book of how they're kind of their basic, their basic things are. But what's nice about this, if we wanted to, we could chain this off to do other things to it if we wanted to. So what we could do is if we have this vector of, if we have this data frame of empty cars, uh, take this, what we could do is we could map this into another function map and we could do something like as dot character if you wanted to. And then I would just do dot X here as well. And I've converted these all into character now. And you can make this as complex as you wanted to. You could keep chaining this map function over and over to do what you wanted, as long as you knew what the output was going to be. You can also do it up here in the map function as well. Um, I'm not 100% sure about this syntax. I picked this up somewhere. But if you use your curly braces here, what you can do is you can pipe it like this and do as dot character. And I think it should still work. Yeah, it still works. So you can do it in this variation as well. So what you could do is you could define a function in here using this kind of like curly bracket. The other thing you could do is you could go up top, define your own function and apply that function into the map function, have it run that way. And then there's these things called mapper functions that um, are specifically for the map um, map per function 
that you can specify for yourself, but that's beyond what we're talking about here. So I know I went, oh, go ahead. It's just because Colleen, it's just that um, um, for the curly, it's because before the tilde people, they use function X curly and they describe the function. It's just that the way that map is here, it means that it's a lot together, but there is a lot of history in the way it's written. So I could understand it's really difficult to get it because uh, it's like to do a 10 step right away. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it condenses a lot of concepts into one. I mean, like this right here, basically I'm creating a function, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create this function and iterate it over empty cars. So <laughs> just this simple thing of like calculating a mean gets very complex. It has like 10 different concepts embedded within it. So yeah, I, I go ahead. Sometimes people, they suggest to be able to use Spark is first to write the function with one argument, just to be sure that it works. Then after to build your map on the function, because actually what map is doing, is just applying, um, changing the argument of a function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I'm just gonna say, I may, maybe this is just a bad habit that I've picked up <laughs> and I've gotten lazy of just like, just applying it like this. But, you know, if you want it to be more explicit in your code, you would define your function above and then apply your function within it. But I guess I've, I guess I've gotten to a it's point where I just got lazy. Often, when, when, uh, because I don't use often, I specify everything so I could remember in three, three months after. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's probably a bad habit that I've picked up and I need to probably fix it. But sometimes when you're just doing interactive coding, you're just like, I got to do this quickly and I'm just going to get it to work. So, but different variations, different flavors for different people. So um, we're kind of running up on the, uh, yeah, we're kind of running up on time. So um, I guess that's probably where we can leave it off for now. We'll kind of dig more into map functions and some other kind of stuff that we use with per, but I think we should just leave it at there, Ryan. Yeah, I agree. We've only got a couple of minutes left and this is a, a pretty, pretty big topic. So um, maybe, maybe we can just pick the rest of it up next week. Um, maybe also we can think about good ways to practice per functions. If anybody has any good ways to practice, then um, then we can talk about that next week. There's a presentation um, online by Charlotte Wickham where she yeah. introduces this one. <clears throat> and I'd, I'd like to look at it next week and I can bring it up uh, if I remember. But I, because I went through it, but I had a hard time with the data. It, I think what's happened is since she gave that talk, the data sources have changed now. And, and so they don't match exactly the way that, that she had it. But um, I, that might be a good thing to just touch on next week. So um, if you guys have already gone through that, I'm sure you'll have things to add there. But yeah, for these functions, for me, I know I, I really need to practice them because I know they're really powerful, but I, I, I've got to get my head around how they work. So. I guess just for my understanding, like what's the like what's the hardest thing to wrap your like what's the hardest thing to try and understand these? Like, I, it was hard for me to first learn it. I had to like kind of have somebody show me it, but just kind of, so I understand where you're coming from. Um, it's a good question. Like, I guess uh, where all the different components, I get, so, so map, the map function has itself has however many components. It's like map, um, and then there's, then there's the data portion, and then there's the function portion that comes right after it. So I think it would be interesting to see uh, to see each of those those different pieces broken out again. So yeah, so you've got it right here. Then the function you want to you want applied. So yeah, just something like that. So that that might be that might be most uh, worthwhile for me. But anyway. yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean it's it's challenging because I mean you got to think of it. The function you want applied. That could be any function. That could be a function you define. That could be a predefined package function. It could be, you know, a chain function. So there's just so many, there's just so many things you can do with it. So um, I guess the way I kind of think of it is, is like applying it to a case that you know. Like I use this a lot to um, 
iterate over a lot of data sets to Im import a lot of separate data sets yeah. and to export a lot of data sets. But um, I see what you're coming from. Yeah, that's probably it. Just finding ways to, to apply it. So, mm -hmm. well, that's good. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking all the time to put this together. I'm looking forward to talking about it some more next week as well. All right, so with that, we will adjourn and we will talk to you guys next week. Bye-bye. All right, thanks. Bye-bye.